welcome young lawyers. Hello, young lawyers, wherever you are. May all your troubles be few. All my good wishes go with you tonight. Anyway, my name is Professor James Dewey. It's great to have you with us here at Regional Law School. It's a privilege to have an opportunity to meet with you and to speak with you and to share a couple of thoughts with you. I was asked if I could teach a thing or two about trial advocacy. I said I'd be happy to do that. I've chosen to speak on the topic which I've titled the hearsay exception that even the best judges frequently misunderstand. Is there anyone here? I assume you've all taken evidence in law school. Anyone here who recalls the hearsay doctrine a little bit imperfectly? Anyone who can say, well, I'll tell you the truth, I didn't exactly understand every single little detail that what they were trying to teach me, and I don't remember all of it quite correctly. Anybody? Just one hand. Okay, I see that. That's great. Well, those of you, the very small number of you who are willing to so identify yourself in public, you're in good company because nobody, almost nobody alive today really understands the hearsay rules from top to bottom thoroughly and correctly. I love this fabulous quotation from the inimitable Justice Stephen Breyer, an associate justice with the U.S. Supreme Court. Several years ago, during oral argument of a case out of Virginia called Briscoe v. Virginia, in a remarkably self-deprecating moment of considerable humility and self-awareness, he said, quote, in a room full of lawyers and observers, I understand hearsay, which you, as we have just seen demonstrated is very complicated, filled with all kinds of rules, some of which I may recall and others of which I certainly don't. Close quote. So there are plenty of people who can honestly say such a thing. Just to remind you, to refresh your recollection, a quick little one slide crash course in the fundamentals of hearsay. Remember the definition of hearsay. Hearsay is defined as evidence at a trial about a statement that was made or an assertion that was made by somebody out of court being offered in court to prove the truth of the matter that was asserted back then. Sound familiar? Here's a little visual depiction of sort of how it looks. Hearsay in a nutshell. Hearsay. Whenever you have a situation where a piece of evidence is offered at trial and you're wondering whether you could object, whether it's arguably objectionable, that situation, by definition, will always involve a two-step process. The first step, a statement of some sort, is made out of court by an individual we would call a declarant. Sometimes it is words that are written on a piece of paper. Sometimes it is words that are spoken. That's probably a little more common. Sometimes it's nonverbal conduct intended as an assertion, such as when a person nods their head in response to a question silently. That's still an assertion. In this depiction here, this visual illustration, as you can see, I'm indicating someone who's actually making a statement with his mouth by speaking words. Then at the second step of the process, step two of the process, this out-of-court statement is then somehow communicated to the jury. It can be done in any way. I mean, if we've got a piece of paper that was written by somebody and I want to show that piece of paper to the jury, that's hearsay. If it's being offered to prove the truth of what was written there. Or if it's on a video or an audio recording and I want to play the recording so the jury can hear the words that were spoken out of court, that's hearsay too, if it's being offered to prove the truth of what was stated on the recording. Or, more commonly, as in this example, sometimes the hearsay rule is violated or arguably violated because you bring a witness in to tell the jury what she heard somebody else say to prove the truth of what he said. So that's just to remind you of the fundamentals. You're young lawyers, so for your sake, this is all probably still very fresh in your memory because it hasn't been that long since you went to law school. I'd like to focus specifically, though, on a, one of the most important exceptions to the hearsay rule for you trial practitioners. And it is, although it is extraordinarily important, it is also tragically probably the hearsay exception that is most frequently and most profoundly misunderstood even by many of the best judges and courts in the country. We'll look at that exception in a minute. But first, let's take a look at two different scenarios, and we'll see how that exception applies to both. Scenario first, we'll call this the, the admissibility of exculpatory hearsay statements by the accused. The defendant, in other words, told me that he was innocent. Here's the scenario I'd like you to consider. Suppose it comes up very frequently. Most of the examples that we'll look at today, by the way, are criminal cases, and so today's talk will be of special value to those of you who intend or expect or may be finding yourself involved in criminal litigation, even if it's only pro se. But these issues also come up with just about equal frequency in civil litigation as well. The reported cases are primarily criminal, but even those of you who do civil litigation, you'll find yourself embroiled in the same issue all the time. And I must caution you, the truth is, more often than not, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, you'll find yourself frequently arguing these issues in front of judges who understand these things only very imperfectly. Because this is, as you will see, a little bit more complicated than most hearsay doctrine. But here's the fact pattern I'd like you to consider. Suppose we have a criminal trial. And the defendant 
wants to put on evidence in front of the jury about statements that he made out of court in which he professed his innocence. This could happen in a couple of different ways. Sometimes, for example, he could call a witness to the stand and ask the witness, will you tell the jury what my client, the defendant, said to you? Yes, he said that he was innocent. Very few defendants have ever attempted something in such a brazen attempt to circumvent the hearsay rules. More frequently, it's done on cross-examination of police officers and other prosecution witnesses, where the defense attorney wishes to ask the officer, officer, isn't it true that when my client was arrested by you and taken into custody, he told you that he didn't do it, didn't he? He told you that he was innocent. He told you that he acted in self-defense and so forth. A good prosecutor in that situation will object every time. Well, wait a minute, hold on, this is hearsay. And the prosecutor, by the way, would be correct. Or sometimes, it may involve a defendant who wants to play for the jury a recording of a statement in which the defendant, talking to the police or talking to a friend over the phone, said, I'm innocent, I didn't do it. Is this sort of evidence admissible? Is this evidence admissible under the hearsay rules? And remember, a good prosecutor will object every time this is hearsay, and the prosecutor will be right. Is this evidence admissible, however? Well, that issue was actually decided among other times, by the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in a case called United States v. Hayes. And this particular three-judge panel included an, an uncommonly impressive collection, an uncommonly distinguished panel of circuit court judges. All three of them had significant professional experience at the United States Department of Justice. One of them had been a former Harvard Law School professor. One of them was the chief judge of that circuit, and the third was a brilliant young man, later described by President George W. Bush as the most brilliant man he had ever met. And he is now serving as the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. But I will not mention him by name. I do not wish to cause any embarrassment for a, for a brilliant, distinguished jurist like that. But here's what the three of them did. In that case, the defendant and the government had evidence about statements that were made by the defendant in which he told a friend before trial that he was innocent actually the way it went down, there were met multiple members of, an, of a conspiracy, and when one of them, when they began to get suspicious that the police were on to them, they got on the phone with each other, and the defendant, correctly expecting by, that by this stage of the investigation, everything was being recorded, he suddenly changed his tune, and all of a sudden on the phone, he's saying, oh, we've got nothing to hide, we didn't do anything wrong, don't worry about trial, we're innocent. I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T. Well, here we are, we're at trial now, and the defendant he obtained, the, he was right, he correctly guessed that the government was recording the conversation, and he obtained copies of those recordings from the government, and he asked if he could play those recordings for the jury. The prosecutor, of course, made the obvious objection, it's hearsay. And the judge made the correct ruling and said, well, it is hearsay, because this is not fair to the prosecutor. You understand the whole reason why we exclude this kind of evidence is because in fairness to the prosecutor, if the jury's allowed to hear the defendant's version of what happened, well, then by rights, the prosecutor is entitled to cross-examine the declarant. And if the declarant is the defendant, well, then he has to take the stand. That's how it works. That's how it works for every witness at a civil or criminal trial. There's no exception for parties, and there's no exception for the defendant in a criminal case. You take the stand, and you tell the jury whatever you want, and then the prosecutor can cross-examine you. That's the way it works. It's only fair. But if you don't want to make yourself available for cross-examination, well, then fine, but then you can't have it both ways. You can't refuse to make yourself available for cross-examination, and yet at the same time insist, but I want the jury to hear my version of the facts. I hesitate even to mention this, but as a brief aside, those of you who know nothing about evidence law or the American trial process except what you saw in the trial of George Zimmerman are at this point completely bewildered like the rest of the nation. You all remember that case down in Florida? A little more than a year ago, George Zimmerman shot a young man named Trayvon Martin. We all heard about the case. He claimed that he acted in self-defense. The case went to trial. And if you follow the trial closely, it's, a, it's unfortunate because your understanding of the way the trial process works has now been altogether almost devastatingly and irreparably damaged because that trial was almost like something from the other side of the looking glass. Because at that trial, you'll recall, for some reason that nobody quite understands, during the prosecutor's case in chief, the jury was actually allowed to see extensive color videotapes of this man, this defendant, George Zimmerman, explaining to the police and explaining to the press and explaining to reporters what happened. He took them, remember, on a tour of 
the place where the shooting took place, and he explained in living color, that's where I was and there's where he was. And these videos incredibly, inexplicably were played to the jury during the prosecutor's case in chief. At which point every defense attorney in the nation knew beyond a shadow of a doubt there was no way this man would take the witness stand. That was the easiest decision in the history of trial advocacy. Why, why put your client on the stand when the jury has already seen him on video, in color, live, taking them on a guided tour of the, of the crime scene, explaining his entire version of the story? It can't get better for you than that. Don't put this man on the stand. Don't let him get cross-examined. But that's not what ordinarily happens. I've never heard of a case where such a thing would ever, where, where such a thing has ever happened. In any other case, just about any other case where that sort of thing would happen, if the defendant were to argue, I want the jury to see the video, it would be the prosecutor who would strenuously, vociferously object, and the judge would exclude the evidence, almost always. So please, completely forget everything you think you learned about hearsay law and the trial practice process and the Fifth Amendment from that trial. Because people who watched that trial, which is sad to say probably includes almost every American, have also got the grotesquely distorted idea that, oh, if the police ask me if I want to answer a couple of questions, I guess it's a good idea to say yes. Because then if we get the whole thing videotaped, I can play the videos for the jury and I won't be cross-examined. I shudder. Literally, watch. I shudder <laughs> to think how many countless young Americans and older Americans got from that trial the grotesquely distorted idea that talking to the police is a good idea, waving your rights under the Fifth Amendment is a great idea. No, it isn't. That never happens, and it won't happen again. Not to you. <laughs> you cannot safely presume that you'll get away with such a monstrous miscarriage of justice, or that the prosecutor will be so grotesquely inept and incompetent as to allow such a thing to happen, and to even uh, arrange for such a thing to happen. This concludes my excursus on that one in a trillion case that has nothing to do with any other aspect of the real world, which I wouldn't have even brought up except you probably already knew about the case. Please do yourself a favor and forget everything you think you ever learned about that extraordinary prosecution. Back to the Hayes case. Well, in the Hayes case, just like George Zimmerman, you'll recall, the defendant said, I'd like the jury to hear this recording of these statements that I made out of court in which I said that I was innocent. The government, of course, in that case, objected that it was hearsay. The government in this case was incomparably more competent than the prosecutors in the George Zimmerman case. The defendant's ingenious response, he said, well, it's hearsay, sure. It is a statement being offered out of court. And it is a statement that is being offered to prove the truth of what was asserted. And so it's classed as hearsay. Some of you, by the way, might be tempted to think at the moment, well, wait a minute, doesn't that come in under the exception for statements by a party? No. Remember, there is no hearsay exception for statements by a party. It's statements by an opposing party. Everything you say can be used against you, but not by you, right? Any prosecutor in any criminal case can always put any witness on the stand and say, do you know the defendant? Yes. Has he ever talked to you about this case? Yes. Tell the jury what he, my opponent, told you. That's always admissible under the hearsay rules. But this was not that case. This was not the prosecutor asking a witness. This was the defendant trying to put on evidence before the jury about statements made by his own client. And that's not admissible under the hearsay exception for statements by an opposing party. It doesn't apply to statements made by your client. So here's what this defendant ingeniously argued. Mr. Hayes and his attorneys argued, well, it's admissible to show a state of mind. And the Circuit Court of Appeals fought it. The trial judge properly rejected that argument because it was bunk. But this uncommonly distinguished panel of judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals said, that makes sense to us. They held that the lower court made error, committed error, in, in excluding the evidence. And the court said that even if Hayes did intend implicitly to assert his innocence, his statements were still admissible to show his state of mind. Close quote. Does that sound logical to you? If it does, don't feel bad. I mean, I've told you already a couple of times, I've given you some rather clear hints that you're totally mistaken, but it's a natural mistake to make. It's an easy mistake to make because when somebody says I'm innocent, that does sound, let's be honest, like a statement about his state of mind. And there is an exception, sometimes known as the state of mind exception. In federal court, it's codified as federal rule of evidence 803 subdivision three. Remember rule 803, identify certain classes, certain categories of hearsay that are admissible regardless of whether the declarant is available. And this particular hearsay exception is titled then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. And let me just mention something else before we dig in a little bit deeper. You trial attorneys, trust me, this hearsay exception is your best friend. If you're the proponent of evidence, if you're the one trying to get evidence admitted at a trial, You'll be surprised if you haven't tried for this yet. You'll be surprised at how very frequently at every trial you'll ever try, significant parts of your case can be proved only through hearsay. Hearsay that is only admissible under this exception and no other exception. 
So very often, when you don't know what else to say, take a moment, stop, take a breath, and real quickly look at those the words you've scrawled on your palm, and then say these words, and you'll be surprised how often you are right. This exception actually accounts intentionally and by design accounts for the admission of extraordinary volume of hearsay at every trial. It's a giant exception to the hearsay rule. You understand? Let's take a look at how broad it is. It says a statement of the declarant is any existing state of mind, such as motive or intent or plan or emotional, sensory or physical conditions, such as mental feeling, pain or bodily health, but not including a statement of memory or belief to prove the fact remembered or believed unless it relates to the validity of the terms of a declarant's will. You've seen this rule before. Well, the Hayes Court was persuaded. And remember, the Hayes Court, for crying out loud, was not a trial court made, making a, a ruling from the seat of the judge's pants in a, in a moment of heated excitement. It was a court of appeals, a distinguished panel that had the benefit of briefing and argument and several months of reflection. And they made the mistake of thinking that, OK, I guess this exception is broad enough to include a statement by the defendant that I am innocent. Is that not a statement of his state of mind? No. Why was the court wrong? The court was wrong because of this critical language. This exception is vast. It is almost unlimited, but it is not unlimited. And the one thing that keeps the exception from being unlimited is this critical, critical language that I've highlighted here in red. Remember, this exception does not include a statement of memory or belief if it is offered to prove the fact that is remembered or believed. This exception, in other words, does not apply to statements by a declarant who is describing mental states if those mental states are memories and beliefs, referring to the past, and if they're being offered to prove the accuracy or the validity or the truth of those memories and beliefs, this exception does not apply to them. So if I have a witness on the stand who's quoting somebody else, a declarant, and the declarant, when he was making his statement, was talking in the past tense, that exception will not be admissible ordinarily under this exception. Now, it may be admissible under some other exception. There are other hearsay exceptions, plenty of them that occasionally accounts for the admission of statements made in the past tense. The excited utterance exception, for example. If I'm excited and, and hysterical and screaming to the police at a lineup with the police, there's the man, that's the man who assaulted me, I scream aloud, hysterical, not even thinking about what I'm saying. I'm talking in the past tense. But that exception, like many others, does apply to statements of memories and beliefs. But this one doesn't. Remember that. Now, for a, a, a quick little diagram to just give you a sense of I mean, when we, when we look at this particular exception, you'll notice it's got exceptions, two exceptions. It says, yes, statements of memory are accept, uh, admissible, but not if it's a statement of memory or belief, uh, unless it's not being offered to prove the fact that remember to believe, unless it relates to the terms of a declarant's will. So what we actually have here, buried deep in the bowels of this labyrinth, is an exception to an exception to an exception to an exception to another rule. Let me just diagram that for you one step at a time, so that like Hensel and Gretel, you'll be able to find your way back out to the edge of the forest by retracing your steps. How do we get to this clause at the end of 803.3? Well, remember, the general rule is, Federal Rule of Evidence states, Rule 402 says that all relevant evidence is generally admissible. But then we've got Rule 802, which is an exception to 402, which says, well, even if it is relevant, it's not admissible if it's hearsay. Because if it's hearsay, then it isn't generally admissible. Unless Rule 803, Subdivision 3 says, unless the hearsay statement is a statement of memory or belief. And then it is admissible. Unless the evidence is offered to prove the fact it was remembered or believed by the declarant, and then it isn't. Unless it relates to the terms of the declarant's will, and then it is. I'm sorry to say I can't make it much simpler than that, but to make it a little bit simpler, I promise you we won't talk about wills again today, at least not before 10 o'clock. So we'll take that out of the picture. But you understand now the general rule is statements of mental, physical, and emotional condition, generally admissible. Unless it's a statement of memory or belief, and then it's not unless it is not being offered to prove the fact you remember to believe, and then it is. Small wonder so many judges get this one messed up. Why do we draw the line there? Why does Rule 803, Subdivision 3, so adamantly and assiduously state that this exception does not apply to memories and beliefs? Well, Justice Cardozo on the U.S. Supreme Court as far back as 1933 correctly stated that if this exception were brought in just a little bit more to allow the admission of statements of memory, offered to prove the accuracy of that, of that memory, there would be an end, or nearly that, to the rule against hearsay. Or as my co-author and I put it in a treatise that we've written on the rules of evidence, obviously, if the exception for then existing state of mind or mental condition included the mental states of memory or belief, offered to prove facts external to the declarant, this exception would swallow the hearsay rule entirely, and it would. 
If this exception were brought in just a little bit more to include statements of memory or belief, well, then everything would be admissible under this hearsay exception because every statement by every declarant pertains one way or another to some aspect of some sort of a mental state, either present, future, or past tense. Now, let's be honest, uh, maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. Maybe the obliteration of the hearsay rule would arguably be a, 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 a net gain for the administration of justice. But we're not prepared yet to move in that direction. And that's why it's vital, as the courts and the Supreme Court and the academic commentators have unanimously agreed forever, we, it's vital that we hold the line by not allowing this exception to be expanded just that little bit. That's the one thing that the hearsay exception cannot cover. Another way, by the way, to make the same point, and this may have never occurred to you before today, I wouldn't be surprised, it is because of this hearsay exception that all inadmissible hearsay is phrased in the past tense. Did you think about Did you ever realize that before? Every trial you'll ever participate in, whether civil or criminal, there will be large quantities of inadmissible hearsay that are offered and then successfully excluded when somebody had the good sense to make an objection. And if you think about it, 100% of those statements, every inadmissible piece of evidence that was ever excluded under the hearsay rule at every civil or every criminal trial in Anglo-American history involves a witness on the stand who is quoting a declarant when the declarant was making a statement in the past tense. Because if the declarant is talking in the present tense, then it's admissible under this exception. Or if the declarant is talking in the future tense, then it's admissible under this exception because remember this exception includes mental states of plan and intent. It's a very broad exception. So, to test your understanding of what we've covered so far, which of the following out-of-court statements are admissible under Rule 803, Subdivision 3? I've got a witness, let's imagine, that's on the stand at a trial quoting some statement that was made by someone else and that other person said the following. Imagine I'm the witness on the stand. I'm telling you what my sister said the last time I saw her alive. And I say to you, I remember I was on the phone with my sister and she told me, quote, I am sick, close quote. Is that admissible to prove that she was sick? Yes, because she's making a then present tense statement of a then existing physical condition. She also told me she was hungry. She also said that she was angry, very angry. She was tired, she told me. She said, I am a woman in love. I am going to kill him. So far, all of those statements are admissible under Rule 803. My sister's quite the chatterbox. It was quite a little conversation that we had this last time I talked to her. All of that is admissible under this exception. This is a huge exception. It is the proverbial wide gate that leads to the admissibility of an awful lot of hearsay. All of these statements are admissible to prove the truth of what my sister said to me. Even if she's not available, even if she's not here, or even if she were, it wouldn't make a difference, remember. I can take the witness stand. Anybody can take the witness stand and tell you, I was talking to a woman named Donna, Donna the declarant, and she told me she was sick, hungry, tired, lonely, angry, loving, and planning to kill her husband. Because all of those statements are phrased in the present tense, and the last one is phrased in the future tense. A, well, a present tense intent to commit a future act. All admissible under this gigantic hearsay loophole. It's not difficult to see. These are the kinds of statements that 99% of the time are admitted. When a statement is admitted under this hearsay exception, it usually is some formulation of one of these sentences. Very, very often it begins with the words, I am. I'm telling you what I am feeling right now. Physical, mental, or emotional conditions and sensations. So it's easy to understand how the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in the Hayes case could have made the understandable blunder of thinking, well, remember, what was the statement, the hearsay statement that was offered in that case? I am innocent. And grammatically, I am innocent, superficially at least, looks just like the rest of these statements. To somebody who didn't speak any English, you might be tempted to think it is indistinguishable, although you would not use those words if you did not speak English. But the problem, you see, is that it's not so simple. Compare those sentences with these sentences over here. All of the sentences on this slide, as you can see, begin with the same two words, but there's an obvious difference. The ones on the left are statements of then existing physical, mental, or emotional condition. The statements on the right are memories. They are statements of then existing memories. If I tell you I am late for my flight, well, maybe you are, maybe you're not, but uh, that depends on what time the reservation was. If I say my sister called me from her car phone and said, oh, I'm late for my flight, she's telling me that the present time, if I recall correctly, is later than I should have left based upon my flight time, which as I recall it, would have been the following. That's a memory. I am cancer free. That's something that somebody must have told you. Nobody, not even a doctor is competent to say, I feel cancer free right now. No, that's, it's not something like hunger that you can actually feel. It's something you must have heard about. Or maybe you read it in a letter from your doctor. Either way, it's something you learned from someone else. It's a statement of memory. I am an only child. That's not something you see about yourself when you look around the car. It's something you remember from your past. I am the firm's oldest partner. I am eligible for my pension. I am five weeks pregnant. 
I am wanted by the police. I am a Native American. I'm a fifth generation Virginian. I am innocent. You see the pattern? All of these statements on the right hand side of the screen nominally superficially appear as if they're phrased in the present tense, but the discriminating observer digs a little bit deeper and you've got to think to yourself and ask yourself, well, was he actually describing something that he was literally feeling at that moment? And the answer is no. On the right side of the slide there, all we have there are statements by individuals who are obviously telling us something about a memory. Maybe it was an accurate memory. Maybe it was a reliable memory. Maybe it was a memory that would be admissible under some other hearsay exception, perhaps, but not under this exception, never. Because if we were to allow these kinds of statements to be admitted under that exception, again, this is the exception over 12 of the hearsay rule in one bite. So those statements are not admissible, and the case law on that particular point is actually very well settled. It's kind of extraordinary that a court as distinguished as, as the U.S. Court of Appeals could make such an egregious blunder in the Hayes case. But they did, and now you understand why they are wrong. Because when a defendant tells anybody, whether it's the police or friends on a recording or somebody else over the phone, if a defendant tells his friends, I'm not worried about this trial, I'm not afraid of this trial, I know it's going to turn out well, I know because I am innocent. Again, somebody who speaks very little English or somebody who doesn't think about it very carefully might be tempted to think, well, you know, superficially that looks just like the sort of stuff that is admitted under this exception all the time, all day, every day, and it is superficially. The critical difference, again, though, is somebody who's professing his innocence is telling us about what he remembers about what happened back at the crime scene. So when George Zimmerman says to the police, I'm innocent, I was acting in self-defense, that's all pure memory, 100% memory. And it is not admissible under this exception, and the court was simply wrong about that. And I suppose it really is a good thing that the court was wrong about that, because if the logic of that opinion could be taken faithfully to its logical conclusion, it would represent an absolutely radical transformation of the American criminal justice system as we know it, and the civil system too. Because then every criminal defendant, under the logic of that ruling, if he doesn't want to take the stand and expose himself to cross-examination, which is a pretty fair summary of every criminal defendant, all of the guilty ones and most of the innocent ones would rather not be cross-examined if they know what they're doing. Under the logic of that ruling, well, no defendant would ever need to be cross-examined again. The defense attorney would simply say, when the judge says, Mr. Billing, you want to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. I call to the stand my client's mama. And then we'll have his priest on in a few minutes, and I'll just ask them both a couple of questions about what the defendant, my client, said to them when they visited him in their cell, and then I'll be done. Cross-examine the mama. Go ahead. Cross-examine the, the priest. You can do that, too. Here's another example of the sort of thing that is admissible under this exception. Officer, can you please tell us what the woman said to you? Yes, I can. She said, and I remember, I quote, my shoe is off, my foot is cold, I have a bird I like to hold, my head is old, my teeth are gold. Defendant objection, hearsay, also I'm not sure how this is relevant. The relevance objection is looks substantial probably, but uh, the hearsay objection would be overruled because virtually all of these statements are what he is experiencing right at that very moment in time. My foot is cold, that's all present tense. Bird, I like to hold, that's a statement of my present preferences. Notice, by the way, one more fine point. When I was giving you a list a few minutes ago, I specifically said that one of the examples I gave you was a woman who said, I am five weeks pregnant. I didn't say five months. A woman who says, I am five months pregnant, she's actually telling you something she can see and feel and touch and you can too, but don't get too close. But a woman who says, I'm five weeks pregnant, now, that's probably a woman who was not actually engaged in, at that very moment in an act of self-diagnosis. She's almost certainly somebody who was sharing with her listeners something that she learned from somebody else. That's why I chose that the way that I did. A woman who says, I think I'm about to have a baby any second now, that's a present sense impression. She knows what she's talking about. Trust me, you'll see what I'm talking about when you get there. So, don't forget, getting back to where we started, we've been emphasizing so far that this hearsay exception never applies to a statement of memory or belief the rule says unless it is not being offered to prove the fact remembered or believed. So <laughs> when would 803 subdivision 3 allow a statement about memory? The rule says, well, if it's being offered to prove the truth of what the woman said, it's hearsay. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's being offered to prove the truth of her memory. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes you can use statements of memory or belief under this exception if and only if it is being offered to prove the truth of what she said, i.e. that she had that memory or belief, but it's not being offered to prove that the memory or belief was valid. For example, how about this testimony? I've got a witness on the stand, a gentleman who's asked, quote, and he, uh, he's being asked to tell us what he remembers his sister telling him the last time he spoke with her. And, he, and the, the attorney asks, what happened next? And the uh, testimony proceeds as follows. The, the, the gentleman on the witness stand says, shortly before 10 o'clock a.m. that day, my sister called me on her cell phone 
let's just take this one little step at a time. How much of this is admissible? So far, obviously, none of this is hearsay, right? My sister called me. That's not hearsay. Nobody told her that it was hearsay. He knows it was her because he recognizes the voice. What's next? She told me that she was on her way to the office. Is that hearsay? Yes, of course. Is it admissible? Yes. Why? Because that is a statement of a then existing mental state of future intent. Here's where I am heading. This is where I plan to go. The theory of this hearsay rule is that when you're describing your plans for the future, the odds of being mistaken about that are relatively low. That's admissible. Next line. She said that she was worried. Stop there. Is that admissible? Yes, worried. It's a present emotional state. Describing what she feels right at that moment, that's admissible too. She said she was worried because she was late for some appointment with a new customer. Now what about that part? That's different. You see? That phrase is not a statement of then something she's feeling at that particular moment. That's a memory. If you're on your way to the office and you say to your brother, hey, it's, it's 10 o'clock already. I'm late for an appointment with a new customer. That's not something you feel like the fact that your feet are cold. That's something you remember from your, what you last saw the last time you looked at your appointment calendar or what she remembers or thinks she remembers about what was agreed upon over the phone as to what day and what time she would meet with this guy. That phrase would not be admissible under this exception if it's being offered to prove that, in fact, her memory was valid, her memory was accurate. She really was late. So would this be admissible? Well, it would depend on the context of the trial. It would depend on the context of the trial. If this were a murder case, let's say, and this woman was the victim in the case, and the prosecutor is trying to use this evidence to prove that, in fact, she was on her way to meet with a new customer, then it would probably not be admissible under this exception. Or if it was being offered to prove that she was late for that meeting, i.e., that the meeting had, in fact, been scheduled for some point in time shortly before 10 o'clock, that it would not be admissible under this exception. Because then it would be offered to prove the truth of her memory. But we could easily imagine a similar case. Let's suppose it's not a murder case. Let's suppose it's a civil case. It's a negligence trial. This woman is not the victim. She's the defendant in a civil trial. She's been sued for negligence. Moments after the call was, and moments after this phone call took place, we'll assume she got into an accident with some other individual who was injured and who is now suing her. And that victim, alleged victim of her alleged negligence, wants to put this evidence on as proof not that she was late, but that she thought she was late. Why? Because it would explain why she might have had a motive to rush and to speed. And therefore, they could use it as circumstantial evidence that she was, in fact, speeding. It would all be admissible logically for that purpose. In that trial, this evidence would be admissible because the plaintiff, the proponent of the evidence, could correctly argue, Your Honor, it is true that I am offering this evidence as proof of the truth of what she asserted, i.e., that she had that memory or belief, but it's not being offered to prove the truth of the memory or belief. It's only being offered to prove that she thought these things were true, not that they were true. At which point the judge will have already lost what you're talking about. And it gets even worse when the judge then turns to the jury and tries to give them the necessary limiting instruction. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you'll recall that there was evidence in this case about a statement made by the defendant to her brother over the phone about how she thought she was late for a meeting. That statement was admitted under the rules to prove the truth of the matter asserted with respect to the existence, vel non, of her belief or memory, but it is not admissible and has not been admitted and may not be used by you as proof of the truth or the validity of the memory or that belief. At which point the jury will say, really? <laughs> you could read that to the jury five times in three different languages. They won't have a clue what you're talking about. We'll move on now to a second scenario that comes up with equal frequency and causes even greater confusion for the court, even greater confusion. This is the subject about the admissibility of hearsay statements by a murder victim that she once claimed to fear the defendant. We'll call this, the victim told me that she was afraid of the defendant. She told me once that she was afraid of the accused. So here's the scenario. And my apologies in, in advance, even though it is hypothetical, it's such a very, very unpleasant thing to even contemplate this early in the morning. Uh, domestic violence is a horrific thing. It's a plague upon our culture, not just in the NFL. but. But I will talk about, we'll use examples of domestic violence because that's where this issue comes up with extraordinary frequency. Suppose you've got a criminal murder trial or a civil trial for wrongful death. A victim has been killed. Not necessarily a woman, but to be honest with you, it usually is a woman. So for the sake of realism and then at the risk of political correctness, we'll just keep it simple by talking for the rest of the time about men who are accused of acts of violence against women without trying to minimize the significance or the tragic seriousness of those kinds of cases. Here's the scenario, though. We've got a guy who's on trial, 
and to try to prove of his guilt, the prosecutor or the plaintiff wants to call a witness. Very often it's a friend of the alleged victim, a friend of the deceased, or a close relative who's ready, willing, and able, if she's allowed to do so, to testify that before she died, my sister or my girlfriend, the victim, she told me that she was afraid of the defendant. Those of you with any experience in these kinds of cases know that this sort of testimony comes up far more often than not. These issues are litigated more often than not. There are very, very few cases, frankly, where a man is accused of violence against his ex or his current wife or girlfriend, where there isn't at least one witness who comes out of the woodwork who's ready and willing to testify, and most of them are quite correct. Most of them are telling the truth, I'm sure. That, yeah, I remember. She's looking back in it now. I remember she told me she was scared of the guy. Most of these women were scared of the guy. Most of these guys, not all of them are guilty, but most of them are guilty. And most of the guilty ones didn't suddenly out of nowhere turn from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Most of them had actually done things in the past to threaten the woman, to abuse her, to, to be violent with her. And needless to say, don't get me wrong, if you can bring in a, the victim's sister to testify, I saw him abuse her with my own eyes. I saw him push her around. I saw him threaten her. Then we don't even have a hearsay issue. That's not a problem. That testimony is obviously admissible. But just as often, we'll have someone on the courtroom, a prosecution witness or a plaintiff's witness who wants to testify, well, I never saw him threaten her. I lived in Montana. But I often spoke with my sister on the phone, and I remember she told me a couple of times that she was afraid of the guy and that he had hurt her, that he abused her, that he had threatened her. Needless to say, the parties will care very deeply about whether this evidence is admitted or not. Its admission will be a huge gain for the prosecution, its exclusion will be a huge boon for the defendant. But is the evidence admissible? Well, let's make the scenario a little bit more detailed. Suppose the prosecutor has a witness who's prepared to testify as follows. Quote, before she died, we're talking again about the victim of an alleged murder. Before she died, I remember she told me once, a week beforehand, that she was afraid of the defendant, her boyfriend at the time, which was, he wasn't called the defendant back then. She told me she was afraid of her boyfriend because he had threatened her and hurt her and said he would do it again and she was thinking about leaving him, close quote. Is that admissible under the hearsay rules? Well, you're starting to understand already by now how it is that because of the way this hearsay exception is worded, very often trial lawyers and trial judges have to get out the proverbial scalpel and carve sentences up into little tiny pieces because it's n almost always a not all or nothing sort of a thing. You see, the tricky part is that let's take that same sentence and diagram it by sticking in some numbers here. She told me that she was afraid of the defendant. Is that admissible under this exception? Probably, yes. I mean, that's a statement of then existing mental state. Currently, I am afraid. And number three, she was thinking about leaving him. I'm planning to leave this guy. Is that admissible? Yes, that's a statement of a future intent. But buried in the middle, right smack dab in between those two thoughts is this other part where she says she was afraid of him and wanted to leave him. Why? Oh, because he had threatened her and hurt her and he had said that he would do it again. That's all past tense. That's all statements of memory. And unfortunately for the administration of justice, there are very few witnesses, if any, I know I have not yet met one, who has the presence of mind in response to a question like this to say to the prosecutor, well, let's take this one step at a time. Let me tell you first about the present sense impressions that you were giving me in the present tense, and then I will separately, if there's no objection, relate the portions of the conversation in which she shared with me her memories and beliefs. Witnesses don't pull it apart like that for your benefit. Sorry to say, that's your job, to train yourself to be able to take it apart on a moment's notice as the thing is progressing. That second part there is not admissible under this hearsay exception. And the law on that point has always been very well settled. In 1991, for example, in the case of West v. Commonwealth, a case that is technically still good law, a case that technically has never been overruled, the Virginia Court of Appeals held that in Virginia, just like every other state, hearsay statements by a victim about her earlier threats and actions against her by the defendant are not admissible under this exception. At least not in the case where the accused makes no claim that he knew anything about how his alleged victim died. So in that example, if we've got a defendant who takes the fifth, hasn't given a statement to the police, hasn't made an opening statement, hasn't offered any evidence, hasn't testified at the trial, but he's accused of the murder of his ex-girlfriend, and the prosecution wants to call a witness who will testify that before she died, the victim, my sister, told me she was afraid of the defendant, this case held that will not be admissible, not under this exception. And that's not a surprise, because the law on that particular point is very well settled. But in 2001, the Supreme Court of the Virginia, the Supreme Court of Virginia made an extraordinary blunder in a case called Clay versus Commonwealth. In that case, let me tell you what happened in that case. In Clay v. Commonwealth, it was just like those other cases we were talking about a moment ago with a small and a not unusual twist. A man was accused of murdering his wife, shot her in their home with a shotgun. 
He talked to the police, he told the police, and he told the jury, and his trial attorney told the jury, that yes, it is true, I shot her and I killed her with a shotgun, but it was an accident. We were having an argument, I was holding the gun, I didn't mean to pull the trigger, I definitely didn't mean to hit her, but the gun went off by accident and killed her. That was his defense. His defense was it was an accident. Well, there you go. At that trial, just like so many of these cases, the prosecutor had evidence and wanted to offer evidence that before she died, this woman had told other people, I'm afraid of him and I'm afraid because of what he's said and done to me in the past that he's going to hurt me. Of course they wanted that evidence in. So would you. I would too if I were the prosecutor, but that evidence was not admissible. But incredibly, the Supreme Court of Virginia held that it was admissible. And here's the logic. Here's the reasoning. This is a quote from the opinion. Because this is being recorded, of course, I'm obligated to acknowledge that the Supreme Court of Virginia is an extraordinarily talented collection of eminent jurists who almost always get everything right. They're extraordinarily talented. And I'm a great admirer, don't get me wrong. Everybody makes mistakes once in a while, I do too. But this one was horrifically wrong. To be as candid. Here's what they wrote in that particular case a little more than a dozen years ago. The court wrote, quote, it is difficult to reconcile the conflicting cases, close quote. By the way, that's not true. It isn't difficult. I could have done it for them in five minutes. I'm going to do it for you in a few minutes. You'll see how easy it is. But I also understand why it was that they could be confused about this because many other courts have made the same mistake. They said it is difficult to reconcile the conflicting cases as to when the state of mind hearsay exception may be used to prove that an alleged murder victim had once claimed to be afraid of the accused. But here's what they said. They said, based upon our reading of the case law, they cited a couple of cases. They say, as, as we understand it, it appears that this evidence is admissible, quote, to rebut claims by the defense of self-defense, suicide, or accidental death. Those are the three special cases when it would be admissible. Remember the West case I told you a moment ago held, still good law in Virginia, that if the defendant doesn't claim anything, makes no claim, raises no defense, then you can't use the evidence. But if he claims self-defense, suicide, or accidental death, well, then it is admissible. Well, that's not true. Here's the problem. We'll call this the tricky trilogy. Imagine the following three hypothetical cases. A man is accused of shooting and killing his girlfriend or wife, or more likely his ex. Here's three different potential defenses, as you well know, that some defendants often will claim or may claim. Number one, self-defense. Number two, suicide. And three, accident. And our first hypothetical defendant, he claimed, yeah, it's true, I, I did shoot her, but that's because I was defending myself. She came at me. She was attacking me first. She was the initial aggressor. The second defendant, hypothetical defendant, in the same case, same charge, his defense says suicide. Yeah, it's true, we were alone together when the gun went off, and it, but, but that's because she grabbed the gun out of my hands, turned that on herself, and shot herself. That's how it all went down. She killed herself. And the third defendant, hypothetical defendant, in the same case, or the same charge, says accident. This was what Mr. Clay said, remember? In Clay v. Commonwealth, the defendant claimed, yes, it's true, I was with her, and I did shoot her, but it was an accident. I didn't mean to pull the trigger. Now. Though some of you are old enough to remember the, the uh, song from Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you guess which one is not like the others before I finish my song? Which one of these cases is radically different from the others in terms of the theory and the operation of the hearsay rules? It is, of course, number three. That's why I numbered it number three. What's the critical difference between the first two and the third one? The critical difference is that the, in only in the first two of those cases, is the defendant making a claim about the conduct of his victim. See? She attacked me. I'm making a claim about what she did. Second case, she grabbed the gun and shot herself. There's a defendant who is also making a claim about the conduct of his alleged victim. But in the third case, when a defendant like Mr. Clay says, she was sitting on the couch, we were just arguing, and I picked up a gun, and I pulled the trigger, and I shot her, and I did it by accident, he's not making any claims about any conduct on her part that justified anything. The first two defendants are relying upon a defense based upon the conduct of the alleged victim, and the third one isn't. Why did the Supreme Court of Virginia, and, and uh, as I will explain in a minute, by the way, that makes all the difference in the world. Why did the Supreme Court of Virginia make the mistake of lumping these three together? Well, if you read the opinion in Clay, you will see that the only case they cite in support of this proposition was a decision by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals called Brown v. United States. And in the Brown case, which was a very well-written opinion and very clearly written opinion, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, you can look it up, they said, yes, self-defense, suicide, and accident are the three times when this sort of thing might be allowed. But if you read the opinion closely, you'll see that they explicitly say when they were talking about accident, they were talking about a case where the defendant says, for example, uh, we were sitting around talking and she was playing with the gun and she was waving it around and she said, hey, you want to play Russian roulette? And she shot herself in the head by accident. 
claims about her conduct. Or they also said in an earlier case where a man claimed in his defense, yes, it's true uh, that uh, the gun went off and she shot herself, uh, but she shot, or I shot her by accident. But that's only because she called me up and invited me to come over to the house. She asked me to come over. And when I got there, she said, hey, I want you to see some guns that I've got. And she handed me one of them, and she showed me the gun. There's the defendant who is relying in his defense upon allegations about the conduct of his alleged victim. She invited me over. She showed me her gun collection. She asked me if I wanted to hold one of them. That would be another different, that would be a case where the prosecutor might be allowed to rebut that allegation with evidence about what her memories and beliefs were in an effort to show that no, a woman who believed those things would not have done what you say that she did. But that's not the Clay case. You see, the Clay case was a very, very different kind of accidental defense. That was a man claiming nothing about his victim, claiming only that this is what I did, but I did it by accident. Now, every evidence treatise on the market, every one that you can find, they all make the same point. Here's one of them, for example. The Federal Rules of Evidence Manual makes the point very clearly. A murder victim's statements of fear of the accused may properly be offered under this hearsay exception that we're talking about to show that the victim would not have acted the way the defendant contends but should be excluded in any case where there's no dispute about the victim's conduct as to which her state of mind or fear would be relevant. The point you understand is this. When the defendant makes a claim in a criminal case, of a, when he makes a defense that rests upon an allegation on his part, that in my defense I want you to understand that this is what my victim did before she died, died just before she died, when a defendant wants to roll the dice and take that, play that gambit, we will allow the prosecutor on rebuttal, on rebuttal, to bring in her sisters and friends to testify, well, actually, here's some of the things that she told me she believed and feared and remembered. That evidence will be admissible to rebut his allegations about the way she behaved if, in fact, his allegations about her conduct are inconsistent with what we know about the things that she believed and the things that she feared and the things that she thought she remembered. But that's not what happened in the Clay case. Mr. Clay wasn't arguing that his victim had done anything. He was only making assertions that he had shot her by accident. Think of it this way. I'll diagram it a little more precisely. Suppose we've got a criminal case where a prosecution witness proposes to testify as follows. Quote, my sister used to be the defendant's girlfriend. I mean, today we call him the defendant. He's the defendant formerly known as sweetheart. Two weeks before someone shot and killed her at her home, she told me that she was terrified of him and she was afraid that he would hurt her. Again, this evidence comes up frequently in these cases. The prosecutor really would like to get it in. Is this evidence admissible? Well, we need to distinguish two different cases. We need to distinguish two very different cases. Would this evidence be admissible? It depends on what the defendant's defense is. Let's say hypothetical case one. The defendant says, yes, it's true, I did shoot her, but it was an accident because she invited me to come over to her apartment that night, and then when I got there, she was showing me her gun collection. There's defendant number one. Defendant number two, more like the Clay case, the defendant says, I don't know who shot her. It wasn't me. I wasn't even there that night. I was out of town that day. I have no idea how it happened. In both of these hypothetical cases, the prosecutor on rebuttal wants to bring in the sister to testify. Oh, yeah? Well, what you're saying can't be true because we know for a fact that a week before somebody shot her, she said she was afraid of you. Let's diagram these this way. There's case one and case two, left and right, respectively. In both, on both sides here, I've diagrammed what the evidence shows and what the, the proffered conclusion is that the prosecutor wants the jury to draw. In case number one, the jury wants to bring a witness who will testify, my sister told me I am afraid of Roger two weeks before she was shot and killed. The judge says, counsel, how is that relevant? And the prosecutor's response is, your honor, this goes to show that this woman was not likely to have invited him over to her house as the defendant claims. We're offering it to rebut the defendant's testimony and the defendant's allegation about her alleged conduct because this evidence proves or disproves those allegations because it proves that a woman like that who was terrified of this man and afraid of this man, the last thing she ever would have done would have been to invite him to come over to the house, much less to show this, danger, this, this man her gun collection. Women don't do that when they are afraid of a man. Does that make sense logically? Yes, it does. Case number two is very different. Case number two is much like the, the Clay case or the more recent Reiner case also decided by the Supreme Court of Virginia, incorrectly decided by the Supreme Court of Virginia, which is also described in that article that you've been given. Uh, the, in case number two, remember, the defendant's claim is, I don't know who shot her. I wasn't even there. Or as in the Clay, that was the Reiner case. Or in the Clay case, the defendant says, yeah, I shot her, but it was an accident. Again, in that case, the prosecutor wants to bring in the sister to say, well, yeah, she told us that she was afraid of you two weeks before she was shot and killed. And that goes to show that you're more likely to have killed her. 
Does that logically follow in a world without hearsay doctrine? Logically? Let's be honest, it does. Sure. Sure, you know that it does. If your sister tells you two weeks before she, somebody kills her that she's afraid of her boyfriend, and two weeks later somebody kills her, let's be honest, every one of us would naturally assume the same thing. We would naturally assume I sup that doesn't prove he's guilty, but it certainly makes him a very likely suspect. But the problem is at trial, where we are subject to the rules of evidence, the well-settled centuries-old rules of evidence, this evidence would not be admissible at that trial. You see, the difference is, in the first case, the prosecutor can truthfully say to the judge, Your Honor, this evidence about this woman's fears, her memories, her beliefs, Although they are in the past tense about the things she thought he had done to threaten her in the past, we don't care whether it was true or false because we're not offering it as proof of his conduct. So we're offering it as proof of her conduct to rebut his allegations about what he says she did. But in case, and that works, that works because in case number one, at least in theory, the judge could actually give the jury a limiting instruction to say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you remember that we let the victim's sister testify about how she said she was afraid of the defendant and how she said he had threatened her and abused her in the past. That evidence is not admissible to prove that he had, in fact, threatened her or abused her. It's not admitted to prove the truth of her memory. I've admitted that evidence for one purpose only, and you may use it for one purpose only, to help you decide, as the prosecutor has argued, whether a woman who believed those things, whether she was right or wrong, would have ever invited the defendant over to her house. The evidence, in other words, was offered to rebut his allegations about what she did to kill herself, that's suicide, or to attack him, that's self-defense, or to have him over to the house and show him her gun and knife collection, that's accident. But in case number two, we can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. A, a judge in case number two cannot honestly say to the jury, this evidence is only being offered to prove that she was afraid of him, not that she had a good reason to be afraid of him, because that doesn't work. Case number two, you can't get there from here. You can't get from the proposition to the conclusion unless we first assume. You can get logically from the, ev from the evidence that this woman was threatened or says that she had been threatened in the past by her boyfriend. Does that logically support the conclusion that that makes it more likely that he's the one who killed her? Yes, but only if we assume that her memories were valid, that her beliefs were valid. And this exception does not allow statements of memory or belief to prove the validity of those memories or beliefs. But the Supreme Court of Virginia, as, as badly as it has erred, isn't the worst example of this. There are similar examples from around the country, and some of them are so mind-bogglingly absurd that it almost makes a typical evidence professor say, why do I even try? Why even try to teach this stuff anymore? I mean, it has been around for centuries, that is true, and we're all supposed to know it. But when state Supreme Courts, left and right, make the most egregious blunders, it leaves, as I say, me wondering sometimes, maybe we ought to just not even bother trying to teach this. Here's, let me give you a couple of hilarious examples. They're not meant to be hilarious. These are life and death cases. But here's a couple of examples of state Supreme Courts, distinguished panels of judges with months of time to deliberate and to read the briefs and to stroke their beards and to listen to the oral arguments, and the blunders that they've made in these cases are the sort of thing that I would regard as inexcusable on one of my students' final exams. In the case of State versus Langley, a murder defendant was accused of murdering his wife. She had been found lying face down dead in her bathtub with her nightgown and her bathrobe and her slippers on. Police asked this man how it happened. Where were you? He denied any involvement. Of course, they all do. Most of them are lying. Some of them are telling the truth. Some of them are innocent. They're all presumed to be innocent. Here's what he told the police. He said, well, you know what? I don't know how it happened. I went out for a walk. When I came back, my dear beloved Clementine was fl floating face down in the tub and my heart is broken, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, he wanted the, the, he wanted the police and the jury to conclude that apparently she had fallen in a tragic accident, slipped and fell in, fallen in the, in the tub face first. Well, in this case, as in every other case like this, the prosecutor had no difficulty finally finding a sister or a girlfriend who was willing to testify what she had told me in the past that she was afraid that he was going to hurt her. They offered the evidence. Of course, the defendant objected it was hearsay, and the trial judge admitted it. He went to the Supreme Court of Minnesota, and he said this is inadmissible. And here is what the Supreme Court of Minnesota wrote. They said they got it half right. The Supreme Court of Minnesota began by saying that hearsay evidence concerning a homicide victim's fear of a defendant is generally not admissible unless there is a dispute over the conduct of the victim immediately before her death. Stop right there. So far, is that true? That's exactly right. That's exactly what I've been telling all of you. You can't use statements of fear by the victim to prove that the, for any purpose under hearsay statements made out of court by the victim about how she was afraid of the defendant because of things he had done in the past, those statements of her by her memories about this guy are not admissible under this exception unless it's being offered to rebut some claim by the defendant of a defense that rests upon an allegation concerning the victim's conduct. It's not about his conduct, it's about her conduct. So far, 
the Supreme Court of Minnesota had it exactly right. But then, in, in the kind of a blunder that makes you le leaves you wondering whether we, we've crossed over the looking glass, the Supreme Court of Mi Virginia, I'm sorry, Minnesota, the Supreme Court of Minnesota then went on to say, but in this case, that does apply, they say, because in this case, the wage conduct was in issue. Oh, really? It was? Remember the guy in that case, Mr. Langley, he said, I wasn't even home when she died. And the Supreme Court of Minnesota, they reasoned as follows. They said, because it shows, quote, she did not get into the bathtub of her own volition, close quote. So you see, it was being offered to prove something about her conduct. Now, the absurdity of this may or may not jump right out at you, but I will show you the absurdity of this. In other words, here's the train of, of logic that according to the Supreme Court of, of Minnesota, the prosecutor was properly allowed the jury to, to draw. The evidence showed what? We've got evidence, hearsay evidence, of statements made by the victim before her death that she was afraid of her husband because of memories and beliefs that she had about things that he had allegedly done in the past. And again, the Supreme Court of Minnesota says, you can't use that as proof about her, his conduct. It's only admissible to show us or to tell us whatever it might tell us about her behavior and her conduct. Okay, how does that work? Well, according to the Supreme Court of Minnesota, the evidence was admissible for the purpose of proving that because he had threatened her, that means he probably had threatened her in the past. Because she said she was afraid, her statements about the fear were probably justified by his past conduct. He probably had threatened her in the past. And if he had threatened her in the past, that stands to reason. Therefore, that means it's a little bit more likely that he probably did, in fact, make good on those threats. And that he drowned her, either before or while he was forcing her body into the tub. And how is that relevant? The Supreme Court of Minnesota says, because that shows that she didn't get into the tub voluntarily. So you see, it was being offered to prove not his conduct, but her conduct. But this logic, although it was endorsed by the unanimous state Supreme Court, is 100% unadulterated gibberish. Because you can't get there from here. You can't get from Proposition 1 down to the conclusion without going through steps 2 and 3. It just doesn't make sense. If a woman says, I'm afraid, I'm very afraid of my husband, and if her fears of him are valid and justified by his past conduct, well, then that does make it less likely that her mysterious death face down in the bathtub was an accident. But the problem is, when statements are admitted under this hearsay exception, the well-settled rule that goes back for centuries says those statements are not admissible to prove that her memories and her beliefs were valid or that they were justified by anything in the past, including but not limited to his conduct. You can't use this evidence. Even the Supreme Court of Minnesota said that you could not use this evidence to prove that he was the one who pushed her into the tub. But they got around that truthful conclusion by saying, yes, but it was being offered to prove that she didn't get in there by accident. Well, you can't conclude. This evidence does not logically support the conclusion that she didn't go in by accident unless and to the extent it first persuades the jury or the judge because he's the one who killed her, because he had threatened her in the past, just like she said. An even more egregious example of this outrageous absurdity was the decision of the Supreme Court of South Dakota in State v. Esau. In this case, the defendant, again charged with the murder of his wife, claimed that she had died in an accidental fall down the stairs. The Supreme Court of South Dakota and again, there was evidence about the statements that this woman had allegedly made in the past about how she had been afraid of this guy because of things he had done even further in the past. Again, the evidence was admitted. Again, he was convicted. Again, he went to the state Supreme Court. In this case, the Supreme Court of South Dakota affirmed the admission of this evidence that she had once told her friends that she was afraid he would kill her. How did they get around this centuries-old body of very well-settled law? Look what they did. And I don't, I don't blame you if you think I'm making this up. Because this is, I think, quite literally the most ridiculous thing I have ever read in my life in a reported judicial opinion, and I've read thousands of them. And if anybody in the Supreme Court of South Dakota is watching this video, <laughs> I'm sure you get almost everything else is really quite right, but everybody makes a mistake once in a while. Here's what they wrote in this case. The Supreme Court of South Dakota held that in this case, the jurors were, quote, appropriately, close quote, instructed to consider the statements, watch this, only for the purpose of ascertaining whether the victim's death was an accident and not in determining whether the accused is guilty. So there's not a problem. There's no problem here. There's nothing to see here. The jury was given a proper instruction. They were correctly and appropriately told that this hearsay evidence is not admissible to prove that the defendant was guilty or that he killed her. It was only offered, just like the Langley case, to show that her death was no accident. But that is absolute, unadulterated absurdity. Because if we were to take a moment to diagram Here's the absurdity of, of what the jurors were told to do in the Esau case. To rebut the defendant's claim in that case that his wife fell down the stairs by accident, the prosecutor was allowed to prove that she once told her friends that she was afraid he would kill her. When the evidence was offered, the, the judge 
said to the prosecutor, well, what's your theory? Where are you going with this? Why do you want the jury to know that this woman, before she died, told her friends that she was afraid he would kill her? The prosecutor's argument was, well, that means that he probably had once threatened her, just like she said. Her memories were valid. They were accurate. They were correct. That means he probably had done things in the past to give her a good reason to be afraid of him, or that he had acted in a way that would give her a good reason to fear him. And that, Your Honor, in turn means he probably did make good on those threats. He probably did kill her. And that means her death was no accident. And the Supreme Court of South Dakota, may they live forever, God bless them all, they held that the, we don't see a problem here because they ruled. The jury in that case was properly told that the evidence listed there on line one, the jury was specifically told you may not use that to prove that he was the killer. You can't go from step one to step three. You can only go from step one to step four. But you can't logically get from step one to step four unless you are first persuaded that step three is also true. The fact that this woman claims that she feared this guy based upon her alleged memories about his alleged past conduct does nothing, nothing to logically dispel the conclusion that her death was an accident unless it first persuades you that it was no accident because he killed her. Just as it does not do anything to logically rule out the possibility that she fell in the bathtub unless it first persuades you it couldn't have been an accident or fall in the bathtub because he's the one who probably killed her. It boggles my mind to imagine that a state Supreme Court you would unanimously be persuaded that a jury instruction like that was one that a jury could be expected to understand. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we're done. That's all I've got. The good news is now you understand, perhaps more clearly than ever before, how this hearsay exception works and how it doesn't work. The bad news is that when you argue the points that I have now explained to you in a typical courtroom, you will be talking to a judge on the odds who really doesn't even understand half of what I've just told you. Good luck. Thanks for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.